If there was ever someone who bridged the gap between country music and rock and roll, it was the Charlie Daniels Band. Growing up in the 60s, I heard my share of country music playing at our house, but I always had my ears tuned to the Beatles and Hendrix. And as the 70s rolled in with Johnny Winter, the Allman Brothers, and Skinner, and I was right there. When I first heard Charlie Daniels, it was the song Trudy off his first album. This was the very funky version and sounded nothing like the later versions we all know now. I didn't really care for the music, but loved the story it told. Then later on, I laughed and enjoyed the story of the uneasy rider. So my first impressions of old Charlie was, he was a souped up version of country music's Tom T. Hall, the storyteller. Nothing special to me, really. And then came the Fire on the Mountain album, and I started to hear what Charlie Daniels was all about. I think Charlie had a big effect on many of us younger kids at the time, but also many of the older country music fans got into Charlie. I know my dad did, and he was a stone cold country music fan, period. He did not like rock and roll and never listened to it, but he would listen to Charlie. Was it his fiddle? Or maybe his bigger-than-life stage presence with his hat, jeans, and cowboy boots. Or maybe just the lyrics and music and the way he delivered it. Whatever it was, in my opinion, the Charlie Daniels Band was the one who brought us all together and led us down that road into what was then called country or southern rock. I know many of my friends were starting to buy Waylon and Willie albums after Charlie came along. I still remember the first time I saw the Charlie Daniels Band on stage. It was in 1975. He was the headliner at an outside concert. Opening that day for him was a three-piece group from Canada called Rush. He had just started building that bridge. So there's a lot to talk about here. Now kick back and let's take a look back at Charlie Daniels. He was born Charles Edward Daniels in Wilmington, North Carolina on October 28, 1936. The only son of William Carlton Daniels, a lumberjack, and his wife, LaRue Hammonds. He was raised in a family that had deep faith in God and valued virtues like honesty and hard work. His musical influences growing up included Pentecostal gospel, local bluegrass bands, rhythm and blues, and country music. In 1953, he along with some friends formed a bluegrass band named Misty Mountain Boys, and it was around that time he started writing songs. Charlie spent his early days tuning his radio to hear broadcasts from Nashville. Music was the theme throughout his early life. By the time Charlie graduated high school in 1955, he was a skilled guitar, fiddle, banjo, and mandolin player. He moved to Nashville. He began making a name for himself as a songwriter, session musician, and producer. In 1964, he wrote the song It Hurts Me with Joyce Byers. It was recorded by Elvis Presley and put on the B-side of Kissin' Cousins. He went on to play on landmark albums such as Bob Dylan's Nashville Skyline, numerous Leonard Cohen albums, and he even tried his hands at producing on the Youngblood's Elephant Mountain and Ride the Wind. Charlie also played on Ringo Starr's Boku's of Blues album in 1970. Here's a photo of some of the musicians and others involved in the project. Charlie is back row, second from the left. Here's the names of some of the others on the album. See if you can find any of them in this picture. Harmonica player Charlie McCoy, Lugas fiddler Jim Buchanan, Neil Young collaborator and steel guitarist Ben Keith, longtime Elvis Presley drummer DJ Fontana, and another guitarist with a bright future as a recording artist, Jerry Reed. Charlie said that working this session with Ringo was great. He said Ringo came in and was just one of the guys. DJ Fontana said Ringo had great meter and feel and was just a breeze to work with. One more quick note about a song on this album. The song I Wouldn't Have You Any Other Way, the female singing with Ringo is Jeannie Kendall, who later on in 1977, along with her father Royce, would record the Grammy Award-winning hit song, Heaven's Just a Sin Away. Around this time, Charlie decided to put together his own band. 
It started out in 1970 with Charlie joined by Barry Barnes, Mark Fitzgerald, Fred Edwards, Gary Allen, and Taz DiGregario. They started recording Southern rock style albums for Kama Sutra. As Charlie was to prove over and over again, he was very good at telling stories in his songs. But as far as the music goes, the first album was okay, but it didn't do well out in the market. Then came Uneasy Rider, another story song, and it seemed to help get the traction Charlie needed for the next big release, the Fire on the Mountain album. This was his fifth album and came along at the right time. Released just a month or so after Charlie held his first volunteer jam at the War Memorial Auditorium in Nashville, Tennessee, with a live cut of Orange Blossom Special from that volunteer jam on the album, people were starting to sit up and take notice. Charlie's story of the long-haired country boy and how the South was going to do it again sent him off and flying down the road, but a few important changes was to happen in the band. So here's a story you might be interested in, and Charlie did not write this story in a song, but he was to meet a couple of people at this time that would really help him and his band take it to the next level. The first person was David Corlew, who was to spend over 47 years with the Charlie Daniels Band, serving in multiple positions, from lighting director, tour manager, and in 1989, took the position of manager of all of Charlie Daniels business affairs, including overseeing the band's touring. He was with them until Charlie passed away in July of 2020. The next was a young guitar player and songwriter named Tommy Crane. I'm going to use some of Tommy's own words he spoke in an interview he did in 2002 with a man named Michael Buffalo Smith to help me out with this story. The band I was in, called Flat Creek, had a road manager named David Corlew, who is Charlie's personal manager now. When the band broke up, David went on to road manage Charlie Daniels, and in 1974, my band, Buckeye, opened the very first volunteer jam, and I actually played the first musical note of any volunteer jam ever because it started with a guitar riff. I had met Charlie that night and he told me that he was losing both his guitar players and drummer and asked me if I would be interested. Well, to be honest, I told him that I was still playing with my brother Billy and I didn't want to leave him. I thought it over for about a week and turned him down. And in retrospect, that was a stupid thing to do. But I was naive back then and didn't know what was going on. One year later, we played another volunteer jam, and at that time, my band had broken up. He asked me again, and I gladly accepted. Charlie said that we would be going on tour the first of the year in 1975. So my wife and I drove to Knoxville and saw a show, and she left me at the hotel and went home, and Charlie and I went up to the hotel room. I learned all the songs from the Fire on the Mountain album, and he and I just set up in the room with two electric guitars and no amps and just played the whole thing and it was just magical. I had never experienced anything like it. Tommy was to play in the Charlie Daniels band for almost 15 years and write on some of their biggest hits. And it was in April of 1975 that I first saw Charlie Daniels live. They were the headliners for this outside concert with Rush opening up for them. I'm not going to go into detail about this show as I've already done a video on it. So I'll leave a link here and in the description below too. If you'd like to check it out and see some of the great pictures and hear the story of that day so many years ago that Charlie Daniels and Rush shared the same stage. I think many know that Charlie was a good hearted guy, but I'm gonna let Tommy Crane speak just a little more here and it'll give you a good idea of what he was like to work for. I guess I co-wrote about 60 songs. Charlie is a super guy, and he takes very good care of his band members and treats them as frontmen rather than sidemen. When I first joined the band, Taz DiGregario, Charlie's longtime keyboard player and piano player, said in his interview, Charlie would let us have a song on every record. Tommy says, 
Taz and I got to do one song per record, and no other artist lets you do that. As far as the writing goes, we'd go out to Charlie's and put all our ideas together and start rehearsing, and this would all gel and get put together. He would give us 50%, and he took the other 50%. And this was so nice of him because he wrote most of the stuff, and we all just added to it. He was super cool to let everyone be a part of the music. That was really big of him, and there was no other man like him alive. I believe that. I really do. I think the pinnacle of the Charlie Daniels Band would have to be the song that Devil Went Down to Georgia, which was on the band's seventh album. Released on April 20th, 1979, the album was named Million Mile Reflections. The title refers to the band's having passed the million mile mark in its touring. The song Reflections is a tribute to Elvis Presley, Janis Joplin, and Ronnie Van Zandt. Daniels dedicated the album to Van Zandt, who was killed in the CV-240 plane crash on October 20th, 1977. Million Mile Reflections became the band's most commercially successful album, being certified triple platinum in the United States and peaking at number five on the Billboard Top LPs charts. It also reached number one on the Top Country Albums chart. The song The Devil Went Down to Georgia won a Grammy for Best Country Performance and a Country Music Association Award for Single of the Year. Pretty good for a song that was wrote in a hurry as a last minute add to the album. Tommy Crane says about the song, We had cut our last track, and then Charlie's eyes got real wide, and he said to Taz and I, Boys, we don't have a fiddle song on this album. We have to have a fiddle song. Then he asked Taz and I to come out to the studio room and he said he had this idea about the devil and this kid having a fiddling contest. I immediately came up with the beginning lick and Taz and I and Charlie sat down and we put the music together in about 30 minutes. We went home that night and overnight Charlie had written the lyrics out and he came in and we recorded it the next day. Songwriting credits for this song are given to all six band members. In 1983, Charlie donated the fiddle he used to perform and record The Devil Went Down to Georgia to the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum. The Devil Went Down to Georgia, In America, Still in Saigon, Saddle Tramp, and the list goes on and on. Charlie's songs were just telling a story. You don't hear him called that much, but I really believe he was as good of a writer and storyteller as he was a musician. Charlie also lent his time and talent to numerous charitable organizations, including the Jason Foundation Golf Classic, an organization that targets teen suicide prevention, and the Galilean Children's Home in Liberty, Kentucky, which provides a home for abused and neglected children. Charlie has been the host of the Charlie Daniels Celebrity Golf Classic and Angelus Concert in Hudson, Florida a benefit for the Angeles, a full-time residential facility and day school program for the severely handicapped. He has been a member of the St. Jude's Children Research Hospital Professional Advisory Board and has been a supporter of the T.J. Martell Foundation and its numerous events aiding cancer research. He has also been the headliner many years for the Christmas for Kids concert at the Ryman Auditorium a fundraiser to provide a happy holiday for needy children. In 2014, Charlie Daniels, along with David Corlew, founded the Journey Home Project, a nonprofit co-founded by Daniels and manager David Corlew to help veterans of the United States Armed Forces. The Charlie Daniels 40th Anniversary Volunteer Jam took place on August 12, 2015 before a sold-out crowd, raising over $300,000 for the Journey Home Project. The list of awards this man and his band has won is just out of sight. He was inducted into the Cheyenne Frontier Days Hall of Fame in 2002. 
He was made a member of the Grand Ole Opry in 2008, elected to the Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum in 2009. But I guess in recognition of his unique and indelible influence on generations of music makers, Daniels was honored as a BMI icon in 2005 and then was elected to the Country Music Hall of Fame in 2016. Those were two of his best, I think. Charlie Daniels and his band brought a lot of people together. I know he changed the way I looked at music back in the early 70s. Maybe it was just me, I don't know. Did he have this kind of effect on you and your music? I do know that myself and many of my musician and music-loving friends who were total rockers found out through Charlie Daniels that you could still listen to and enjoy country music and still be cool. Is he a legend? A national treasure? Them are pretty big words. But then again, Charlie was a pretty big man. I gotta go. There's still so much left unsaid here about Charlie Daniels and his band. Maybe you can add to it in the comment section below. And if you enjoyed the video, please give it a like and subscribe to the channel. I'd appreciate it. Thanks so much for watching.